So, Mike, thank you so much for joining me for um, a Corona conversation. Could you maybe just tell people um, what you do for a job and, and where you are in the world? Yeah, I guess, Adam, uh, firstly, thank you for inviting me to speak uh, to you. Um, so, I have two jobs, I suppose. One is I'm a clinical lead. I'm a consultant addiction psychiatrist, and I lead addictions for the London Borough of Lambeth, which is one of the largest boroughs, lar largest treatment services in London in the United Kingdom. And then secondly, I'm a national clinical advisor to um, Public Health England's Alcohol, Drugs, Tobacco and Justice Division. So two jobs, I suppose. And, and at this very moment in time, both of those are perhaps more important than ever, particularly the one offering national guidance um, to other clinicians. So I guess my first question is, what's been the impact so far? And today is the 31st of March of COVID-19 on people who use drugs and alcohol in a problematic faction in London and, and the wider UK. I think probably, you know, I think London got hit first. So we were maybe a week or two ahead of the rest of the United Kingdom. And now it's, it's I mean, it's fed out across the country. I, I, I mean, I suppose a few things. I mean, because in healthcare terms, I think, Adam, you know, nothing's probably more important, but nothing is more important than stopping or reducing the harm from COVID-19. And then how you adapt the treatment system to do that is really important. At the same time, I think there's been a huge reduction in the amount of illicit drugs that are available. Um, so, I, I, you know, I think splitting up, maybe still thinking along what those two things have led to um, within the, the, the drugs field. Um, well, first of all, from the treatment provider's response, um, probably going back about maybe two and a half weeks now when it really began to hit maybe three weeks, a lot of the providers were getting together with the help of Public Health England, but a lot of people independently coming to the conclusion that actually, if we're gonna to need to reduce patient contact, when it comes to opioid substitution therapy with methadone and buprenorphine, uh, we're gonna to need to get people off supervised dispensing as much as we possibly can. And even moving beyond that, you know, moving away from daily dispensing of, of medication. You know, a lot of our patients, a lot of our clients, our service users have a lot of physical illness as we know, 90 odd percent of them smoke, a lot of COPD, which puts them massively at risk um, for dying of COVID-19 or whatever. So it's a question of having to get them away from as, removing them from as, as little contact or as they need. So I think there's been a large shift of supervised dispensing and um, towards less frequent forms of pickup, which has taken place. I mean, certainly there's been a lot of collaboration across the field. It's actually been really impressive and quite warming to see kind of people coming to the same conclusions, accepting the fact that we need to do this. And I think most providers are moving down that track. I think if some are a little bit slower than others, that would be more related perhaps because COVID-19 hasn't hit yet, you know? So I think that's one, <clears throat> excuse me, that's certainly one thing, Adam, that's been happening. Um, and that's um, been quite strong across the board. And as I say, not just moving people off daily, to, off daily supervised, but uh, but moving them to three times a weekly pickup, a weekly pickup, or even fortnightly pickup. Um, and obviously then there's other things are happening because at the same time, um, the service users are afraid. They want to get off the streets. They, you know, they, you know, a lot of the old things that would have happened in the past, the drug supply has fallen away in the United Kingdom quite significantly, I believe, from talking to people. Um, as well as that opportunities perhaps for gaining money to buy drugs over the, you know, so going out in the streets of London, whatever, those opportunities are less there. So we've seen a lot of people in my own, my own service in Lambeth, we've seen a lot of people we haven't seen for a while okay. have turned up to start on treatment, you know? So, so I just want to roll back to you saying that there's already some evidence of drug supplies closing up. Is that from clients that you're talking to or is that from other sources because my sense is it was too early to tell whether supply chains had been interrupted to the extent where the end user would kind of notice hey, what i'm hearing from service users i mean i've lots of people who say they haven't been able to get crack cocaine for days which is quite remarkable in brixton and um, now whether that's true for all i don't know but the service two service users today reported that to me and people tell me the quality of heroin has got worse 
Okay. Okay. So, so, so it's it's interesting. Now, whether some of that is driven by fear, whether it's driven by a version of the supermarket queues that maybe people have bought by, I don't know. But um, I mean, you would predict it would happen though with the closure of borders across the world that you hear about, such as the seeding the border between Afghanistan and Iran. And, yeah. and uh, as like it's something you perhaps predict would happen, but I don't have any special knowledge other than what my service users are the services. And, and that's often where you're going to get the first information from. Yeah. The second thing that I thought was really interesting is people coming into treatment now because it's no longer easy to sustain an illicit drug habit. Linked to that, are you also seeing people who have previously kept their methadone doses a little bit low so they can use on top now coming in seeking? increases in their dose to get fully stable, like optimized doses or not? No, I, I think most people, they're looking for a dose that'll hold them, remove withdrawals. You know, I think kind of, I haven't seen a big push towards the optimizing doses, although we will work people up a bit more gradually than we might have done in the past, but we will work people's doses up. What I'm seeing is people coming in, looking for 20, 30 of methadone and not in a particular rush to go over 30, say. You know, but they're coming into treatment and they're seeking. Okay. So with a potential dry up of traditional illicit drugs, one of the things I've been concerned about is maybe, maybe people shifting towards prescription medications. Yeah. Benz, and opioids. Is that something that's filtered through to clinical services yet? Or is that me just worrying unnecessarily? I think your chances of getting to see a GP... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you'd be lucky you know i mean there's no slight of my gp colleagues you know but i mean you you know it's hard to get a, to get to see them at the moment so so that would be a struggle i mean what i have seen i mean there's certainly one client or one or two clients you know who have been in who have sourced a lot of benzodiazepines from china and whatever and uh, they're not be, they're not able to get that and they've come seeking you know, I wouldn't, they've ended up in hospital in, in bad withdrawals, you know, I'm trying to switch to GBL instead of diazepam, you know, so but that's just one or two cases. Adam. Okay, so it sounds so far the response by treatment services has been very responsive, everyone coming to a very similar idea of what needs to happen. Has there yeah. been an even wider opening of the gates with lower threshold services embraced elsewhere in the UK you know in Brixton you already deliver a fantastic service which has a low threshold entry but elsewhere are people now lowering the bar and making it easier for people to come in I don't know is the honest answer for you I mean because I think the old days of the National Treatment Agency having that kind of level of command you know, they know exactly what everyone was doing those days are gone you know one of the things that Britain has moved was a more diverse diffuse kind of structures and um, so certainly centrally in public health England we would be encouraging all services to remain open and to continue to see patients you know because actually you know if you treat someone with opioid substitution therapy then they don't need to do the things they do have to do to buy drugs which can involve actually interfacing with more people so it's a good thing you know um, but I, I I can't actually say, I, the, the honest answer is certainly the Public Health England position is that all services should stay open as much as possible and um, to continue to treat people and to see new clients coming in off the street and not to shut off. And you're still seeing that group face to face as opposed to shifting as many GPs have done to kind of telehealth or, you know, video linking. We do as much as we can on the phone, Adam, you know, but when it comes to putting out a new prescription, they need to be seen you know, so they'll come down to Brixton and we'll see them. We, as you know, we've got a large airy waiting area, we, you know, and we stick to the Public Health England guidance, which is fine, keep two metres apart. So it means all physical observations are gone. As such, there's no pulse, there's no t temperature, there's no um, blood pressure because these things, you can't really clean them down after they touch a patient. You know, you, you suddenly blood pressure cough. Um, urine drug screens, we've stepped away from them, obviously, because although I know that it's not secreted in the urine, if your kidneys are fully intact, obviously a lot of our patients, our clients have blood and protein in their urine from various things, and it can come out with that. We just want to minimize the contact, but we will see people, you know. Um, but we don't have that many, 
there are some new new people which you have to be a bit more cautious on but most of the people you know we've seen them at some stage in the last 10 years Does that makes sense to you and they're, just coming, they're just coming back again to see us so we, we see them we start them off we give them scripts not supervised and um, some of the ones who we might be more wary of or who have been burnt by, it's a bad way of saying it, but might have gotten into difficulties in the past, they might end up for the first few days in daily dispensing. Mm -hmm. But others will end up on pick up for three days. You've got to store it yourself. Here's a locked box. Here's the risk. So it's kind of, in a way, it's kind of changing that dynamic, isn't it, from a kind of the old paternalistic models, perhaps, to the ones that are kind of free it out, are, 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 are treating the clients more equally, perhaps. Is that a fair way of putting it? And that's certainly something that's been fed back from people involved from a policy perspective, that they are embracing the way, particularly in the UK and Australia, services are shifting, shifting to what they would consider a much more respectful, um, equal relationship. And, and they're questioning that perhaps when COVID is just a Netflix series that we watch, that maybe things won't go back to how they were. Is it too early for you to think about this causing lasting changes in drug treatment? I suspect it will cause, I suspect it will cause changes to the entirety of healthcare across the world. And I think drug treatment is, um, is one of the things that will change. I mean, just to be clear, Adam, I mean, the kind of, I mean, very basic kind of assessment of risk you make when you're taking people off supervised leaving them is the risk of transmission of COVID-19, you know, um, and the risk of them dropping off their prescription and then go back to illicit use versus the risk they might divert it and yeah. something bad might happen, are they, you know, which is really what it, I mean, as an intervention in a way, perhaps as always that supervised dispensing is about. And at the moment, Clearly, the risk of COVID-19 transmission and people dropping off, in my view, it's a personal view, not a public health view, massively outweighs the, the risk of diversion. And right, there is something in the equation now that completely rebalances where your, your risk has to be focused. Yeah. Which a month ago would have been, yeah, un unheard of. But it's, it's so good to see, not so good to see, but... When I, I spoke to someone in Australia and he said, we've basically just ripped up the rule books for how we've delivered treatment for the last 15 years because we have to. Like, yeah. it's not that the rule book was wrong. It's just the playing field has changed. Hmm. So it's just the right thing to do. I, I, and, I think, I, and I think that's right, Adam. And, but, um, it, you know, I mean, I think at the same time, it's finding what the right balance is. Because when it's over, if you remember, I think it was Hamid Goldze in, the, um, in George's, you know, they used to look at the deaths in England. They used to analyse them. They did a deep dive, I think it was 2013, and they found that in two-thirds of the methadone deaths, they couldn't find a valid methadone prescription for that person who died. Um, and there was no, there's no police seizures of people importing methadone into Britain. You know, there's no one mixing up methadone is still across the road from, yeah. from Lorraine Ewart House. And I think it's high, you know, but, but I think, you know, this old idea of three months, you must be on supervised dispensing for three months. You know, these are kind of things. I can't see it going back to that. And I think hope, you know, we may end up in a more, in a more trusting and less paternalistic position. Yeah, I, I, my, my, I, I'd agree with you. And, and, you know, Shane Dark's research would go that, the number of people dying from methadone, the more takeaways you had, the more people died. But if this actually allows us to shift towards a more trusting, open relationship where people know there's benefits in looking after their takeaways, if you're lucky enough to have somewhere to store them safely, then I, I think you're right. It might be one of the positives that come out of it, but you can't deny the fact that, you know, methadone in the wrong hands kills people. But, but even within that storing safely, you know, I mean, we're, we're facing the problem. I mean, take hostels, you know. So you have people who have COVID-19 who have to isolate in a hostel. What do you do? You know, how, 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 you know, so we give them a locked box. You try to get the hostel staff. Maybe they can go to the chemist every day to collect it. And often it's interesting. Sometimes the service users actually don't want it. They don't want to be bullied or threatened. Yeah. For, for their method of, so it's finding the right so, you know that works for individual people but I think the old way the old blanket way of doing things that some services might have had I can't see us going back to that Adam
Okay, so final thing is, with people encouraging physical distancing, that might lead some people to now use on their own when in the past that wouldn't have been the issue with a greater risk of overdose. Is there being a, a reminder of everyone to have naloxone, to re-emphasize all of those existing harm reduction measures, but particularly, particularly making sure there's naloxone everywhere for these groups who may be quite new to treatment or certainly new to having large doses of methadone in their person? But certainly locally, we are pushing out. You know, everyone is, is offered a given a four stall of <laughs> an naloxone syringe. Um, and seeking that that's available within that the hostel staff locally, LAMP, are trained to use it and associate it. So our peer, you know, have excellent peer network in Lambeth who've gone out and trained the hostel staff of service users. Um, and, they, and, 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 and so the staff are trained to that. And nationally, there will be a big push in that. I think there's just been a big release of, of naloxone uh, syringes um, across kind of, by the pharmaceutical company, which has been given out across the, co the country. And certainly in public health thing that there would be a big push along with that. So along with getting people off supervised, make sure they've got naloxone, you know, what are all the safe things, safe storage, all these sort of things have been, you know, this has been put out and uh, will be put out in the guidance that's come. But I think the field, the field has been ahead of that, I think, generally is my understanding. And I think actually everything you've said to me, I think would be reassuring for any people in treatment within the UK, just how quick to respond services have been and, and how consistently positive that response has been. You know, drug treatment often doesn't get lots of thumbs up from particularly people in treatment, but it sounds like actually for now the UK is doing everything right and as much as they can possibly do, which um, is really well, I, good. I mean, I think the thing, certainly the supervision, the thing about it was is there was, you know, pretty much everyone reached the same conclusion independently, very rapidly. And, you know, so um, lots of people rang me, obviously, the national role and said, what's this? And I'm thinking, this, does that sound right? And I'm saying, yeah, well, we're doing this and that sounds right. You know, and it wasn't like there was one opinion that sometimes happens in fields, forcing it way down. Everyone was saying, we can't do this, we can't. And it, that, that was quite rewarding to see, you know. And, and, and that, that's reassuring that common sense prevails at times of crisis and people come together. Yeah. Um, which is fantastic. And um, look, Mike, thank you so much for your time and thank you so much for sharing what the UK's response has been. Um, and yeah, stay safe and healthy. And um, yeah, I'll get to see you at some point when yeah. this is all over. All right. 2020. Thanks, mate. Look. Cheers. Cheers. Just taking it one day at a time Still don't know what I'm trying to find Really I don't mind Cause I'll be fine Yeah I'll be fine